Amen. So you're going to keep your place in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're not going to get there for um, a few minutes, but I might have you turn somewhere else, and you're going to go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So keep your spot there and don't lose your place in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So the title of the sermon this evening is Santa Claus is Evil. All right? And you're like, oh, really, Pastor, are you really going to preach a sermon, Santa Claus is evil, that's really the title of the sermon. Yes, that's the title of my sermon. Now, let me first say when I start off here that, you know, I'm not mad at Santa Claus, all right? I'm not upset at Santa Claus because Santa Claus is not real, all right? So I'm sorry, kids. I'm sure all the kids in the, the church already knew that. We have the kind of kids in this church that are the ones that are ruining it for all the other kids out there, right? They're out there at Home Depot probably telling everybody that, Santa Claus is not real, and you've got 10-year-olds crying on the ground that Santa Claus isn't real. But the point I'm, I'm getting at, and the reason that I would preach a sermon like this, and I haven't preached a sermon like this um, really ever, I, I don't think. I think I've mentioned it before. It, it's, the thing is, though, it's not harmless. When I say Santa Claus is evil, what I'm talking about is he's obviously fake. It's not a real thing. I'm not up, you can't be upset at the Easter Bunny. You can't be upset at Santa Claus. I'm talking about the idea of Santa Claus. I'm talking about the idea of these things. This is why I always find it interesting when you see these hardcore atheists like Richard Dawkins and all these people that, you know, they're literally angry at God. And I'm like, what in the world? You don't believe in God. How can you be angry at someone that you don't even think exists? It's odd. It's weird. So I'm not upset. I'm kind of joking when I said, you know, you know, Santa Claus is evil. The idea of Santa Claus, though, is evil. And I want to show you that this evening. Just like everything else that is false today, there is a subtle agenda to the Santa Claus fairy tale or whatever you want to call it. I guess the Bible would call it a fable. So you say, are you really preaching a sermon against Santa Claus? And the answer is yes. And I want to show you three reasons tonight why it's not something that's not serious. It's something that we should all take serious, and it's something that we should be able to defend when people come after us and say, oh, you don't, you know, have your kids open Santa gifts, or you don't, you know, per perpetuate that lie to your children. So I'm going to give you three points tonight that show you from the Bible how it is not an unserious thing. That's actually the devil's agenda, by the way, is to get you to take things that are serious, that, that make things that are serious, to subtly make them not serious. As a matter of fact, one of the guys said in the promotional video for the church, I think it was Brother Alex, but he just said it beautifully, where he said, you know, what the Bible does is it makes sin pop up to you. It makes sin exceedingly sinful, the Bible would say to you, whereas what Satan is trying to do is make sin less visible to you. He's trying to make sin, you know, covered up. He's what? He's subtle, the Bible says, meaning he's sneaky. He's silent. He's not up front. That's why, you know, false religions many times are subtle. They're lies, but they're subtle about it. Why don't you just come out and say that you think that I can have my own planet one day, Mormons? Why don't you just come out and say that I can be just like Jesus and be, you know, the, the leader of my own alien planet? Why don't you come out and say that? But that's not what they say. They say it subtly. We believe the Bible. We believe exactly what you believe. Why? Because they're perpetuating a lie. And subtlety is Satan's game. And Santa is no different. So I'm going to give you three reasons tonight. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Keep your place in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to take, give you three reasons why... You should, you know, defend your stance of, you know, not buying into this lie that everybody else out there is buying into with what? Their children. That's the first point right there is the, re the first reason Santa Claus, the idea of Santa Claus is evil is it targets kids. It targets children. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So the average age in the U.S., this may surprise you, especially the parents in the room, this is going to surprise you. The average age in the U.S. where children stop believing in Santa Claus is right between, it's about eight and a half years old. Between eight and nine years old, by 10, by age 10, think of that. Look at the, the small children in this room, by age 10, 20% of kids still believe in Santa Claus in the United States today. Now just, we talked about this on Sunday, but compare this to salvation. What are, the, what are the general age ranges 
where you know children will get saved if they're they're sitting in a Bible preaching church and they're out soul winning with their parents. The age ranges where kids will get saved are way before ten. It's five, six, seven, eight years old. These kids will get saved. So you literally just just wrap your head around this for a second. You could literally have a saved saved child out there that still believes in Santa Claus. I mean, how I mean, as a as a Christian parent, that 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 drives me crazy to even think about that. But look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 14. The Bible says this, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. So just to break this down for a second, Paul, he's talking to adults here. Okay, he's not talking to children here. But he's saying don't be like children who are what? Who are easily deceived, who are tossed to and fro, pointing out that children are easily deceived. By what? By the slight of men. So men will lie to you, and it's the children. Paul is using the example of a child, the picture of a child, to say, you, as an adult, as church members, as brothers and sisters in Christ, at the church in Ephesus, at this church, everywhere, he's like, you shouldn't be tossed around like a child. Meaning that you can be tossed around if you are a child. The Bible teaches all the time, I'll just read for you Proverbs 22, verse number 6, where the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does that mean? Train up. That means they're, they're not trained. They're not up. They need to be trained up. They need to be taught up. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this. Actually, turn to Proverbs 22, 6. You can look at the verse with me. But I don't know if you've ever thought about this this way. But you know what? What if you applied that in the negative? You ever think about that? Train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. What if you have somebody that trained a child in the wrong way? Now, obviously, salvation, the Holy Spirit, any adult can get, get saved and follow the Holy Spirit and change in their life. But this is generally true of many people. If they were raised wrong, if they were raised the wrong way, they're not going to depart from that. You could apply this to the negative as well, even though the Bible is really saying, look, train them this way, and then when they're old, they won't depart from it. How can I... How can I raise my children to, you know, this is the big question for the Christians today. When kids get 18 years old, they stop going to church. They're not going to church anymore, and, and kids are leaving Christianity and all this kind of stuff. Well, they haven't been trained up in the way they should go. That's why. That's why they're in some happy, clappy church that doesn't preach any Bible, that tells them what they want to hear. We'll get there in just a second, back in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Tells them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. You get somebody that stands up behind the pulpit and gets to a verse and, and starts talking about some sins that he knows he's staring at in the church. He's like, I don't want to say that. But you know what? What's not said is, can also be a lie. If you sit there and you, as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, you get up and you preach day in, day out, week in, week out, 150 sermons a year, and you never preach on something else, that's a man that's lying to you. That's a man that's not telling you the truth. So a child needs to be up. When what? When they're young. The Bible here is implying that children are very impressionable. That children can be tossed to and fro. Look, so on the first point that it targets kids, parents, look, you better get paranoid. You, if you're not paranoid already, you better get paranoid about things being pushed on kids. Why? Because they're impressionable. Because they can be tossed to and fro. What do we see today? What do we see all the perverted agendas today? Who are they targeting? The kids. Every single time. All the sickos and, and, and perverts and all that stuff is being pushed where? It's not being pushed on adults. It's being pushed on impressionable children. Why? Because it works. Because this is Satan's subtle plan. It's evil. And look, Santa is no different. The imperative of a trainer, 
is that you have the trust of somebody that you are training. I mean, look, the best trainer is somebody that everybody that he's training just completely trusts him. So why, as a parent, would you lie to them? Why, as a parent, would you tell them anything that is not true if the truth is what you're after? It's just like a pastor that lies to you. But that's what the Bible says. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that people will want people that lie to them. People that want people that will tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Look, and I'm talking about even about something small. And I'm going to show you this evening that the idea of Santa Claus and teaching kids Santa Claus is not small. There's an agenda behind it to undo what the Bible teaches about the very basic points of salvation. Look, I was thinking about this today, this, this parenting idea, and why all these kids are being targeted for all these different things, Santa Claus just being one of them. And I was thinking about this analogy to just kind of figure out, how could I make an analogy about kids being tossed to and fro, kids needing to be trained up. If kids are trained in the wrong way, they may never depart from that, just like if they're trained in the right way, God promises they'll never depart from it. But I was thinking about this, and I thought about, I thought about, I had this, I, I had like a real live, like most of you younger people probably don't know this, but like the real Red Rider wagon, the metal one. You know what I mean? That's what I had when I was a kid. And I had this huge hill by my house, and I decided I wanted to make a go-kart out of this wagon. And it was the wagon where if you fold the handle back, you hold the handle like this and you can kind of steer it with the, with the handle. And it was the real metal wagon. And what I did was like, this wagon, this is a steep hill, it's going to tip over if I go down this hill in this wagon. So what I did was I, I grabbed some wood out of the, the wood pile that my dad had, and I grabbed these really sturdy pieces of wood that were like, it was like door casing. And I made these wings out of the, on the side of the wagon. And, and I, I attached them to this metal wagon with, I think I used nails. I just nailed them right through the metal wagon. And so I had these, these wings that I thought were really structurally sound. And I got to the top of this hill. How do you think it went? They broke off and I almost killed myself. But the point is I was thinking about this analogy today about parenting. And parenting, what the Bible is telling us about parenting here is that parenting, you're, you're getting in a go-kart and you're kind of at the top of this big hill in this go-kart and you're kind of putting your kids in the go-kart, and you're riding down the hill, your kids are riding down the hill in this go-kart, and at the top of the hill, it's not very steep. The wagons, and look, there's no brakes on the go-kart. There was no brakes on that red rider, rider wagon, none. Once you start going down the hill, you're going down the hill. This is the parent's life right here. At the top of the hill, it's not steep. It's not steep and you have a lot of control. But as the hill goes on, the wagon starts going faster and faster and faster, and you get less and less control. At the top, you can make major corrections. This is what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that children are easily impressionable. Look, that's, that's where salvation is in that area up there. Salvation's at that top of the hill where there's easy corrections and they're very impressionable four five six years old but as you go down the hill and the speed picks up the danger becomes greater the danger becomes greater and the corrections that you can make become much smaller when those kids get to be seven eight nine ten years old the problems that you can run into get greater and greater and greater as you continue down the hill remember there's no brakes there's no saying, oh, we need to stop, walk back up the hill, and start over. No, no, no. You're headed down the hill. And you can only make corrections, big corrections, at the top of the hill. At the bottom of the hill, you have good destinations. At the bottom of the hill, you have, you have a good place you can end up. Where's that? That's the victorious Christian life. That's the child that, that got saved up towards the top of the hill. And not only did they get saved, they learned the Bible, they're spiritual, they're a soul winner, and they want to they go out, they want to get married, they want to have a family, and they want to continue living for the Lord in their adult life. That's the victorious Christian life. That's the destination at the bottom of the hill where everybody wants, everybody wants that wagon to end up. Everybody. But there's all sorts of other really bad destinations down there, too. 
there's bad destinations down there like jail, like drugs, like the feminist life of misery. Like the young lady that decides she just doesn't want a family and doesn't want all these things. Oh, she'll figure it out when she's 38. You're already at the bottom of the hill. You can't go back up the hill. See, the problem is, though, the problem is, is that people don't pay attention at the top of the hill. They spoil their kids at the top of the hill. Instead of training them, they spoil them. They give them whatever they want, whatever they think will make them happy. Whatever the cultural norms say that the kids need and the kids will, will like, that's what they give them. All the stupid cultural norms like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and Halloween, it's all the same thing. Then they get to the mid-bottom of the hill, they get to the midpoint of the hill and they're starting to see what's on the bottom. And they don't like it. They don't like what's down there. You know, the drugs, the failure, the fornication, the disease. The whoredom, the whoremongering, the illegitimate children. They don't like all that. Nobody does. They like Santa Claus and all the other lies where they're just like, they're just willy-nilly with, they're just, let's go over here, let's go over here. The school says I should do this, and the counselor says I should do this, and the TV says I should go this way. And they get to the bottom, and they're in hell, and they're like, how did I get here? It's because they didn't pay attention at the top, and you can't steer at that point. When you're going 50 miles an hour down the hill, and you're almost at the destination, it's too late. It's not going to work. So the Santa thing is just, it's a lie. It's a lie. You're up here at the top of the hill, and you have all the power to be the most impressionable that you can be. See, look, it's, it's not about making your kids happy. It's about telling them the truth. The Bible is talking about training about nurturing. It's about teaching them the truth. There should be no lies at all in that. At all. Because if you lie about one thing, what else did you lie about? The trainer must have the trust of the person being trained. Look, the reason that Santa targets kids is because they're the most vulnerable and they're the most influenceable. It's very simple. You say, well, what, what's the big deal? Some fat man flies around with his deer and gives people presents. What's the big deal? Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So the first problem is that it targets kids in their most vulnerable times of their life, at the top of the hill, at the beginning of their life, when they're learning everything and they're the most trusting of you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the, the second reason that Santa Claus, the idea of Santa Claus is evil, is it makes Jesus fake. He's like, what? That's pretty extreme. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, preach the word, be in instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Paul is talking to a future preacher here. He's telling them, Preach the Bible, preach the whole Bible, whether they like it or not. Whether it's popular that day or it's not. Say the whole thing. For, and he's warning him, he's telling him this, he says the time will come, well they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. He's saying there's going to be a time where they're going to take the Bible preaching pastor and they're going to throw him out. They're going to want some pastor to come in, and they're going to want the pastor to lie to them. They're going to want the pastor to not tell them everything in the Bible and just tell them only good things and not the bad things, which is probably like that much of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, I mean, God's, it's all warnings. It's all warnings and wrath. Why? Because God loves us. That's why. And they shall turn away their ears from what? Look at that. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto 
fables. Paul is telling this preacher here, this future preacher, that there's going to be a time when people, they grab somebody to tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear, not what God has told them. See, folks, it's not about whatever makes your kids happy. That, that's not your job as a parent, and that's the attacks you'll get on people. Oh, Santa, it's, it's fun and, and, and all this, but it has nothing, being a parent has nothing to do with just doing things that make my kids happy. You know, these are the parents that you, you'll find a, a parent that just wants to make their kids happy no matter what, and they will lose control of the wagon at the top of the hill. You got a parent that can't control a three-year-old or a four-year-old, you have no chance. You have no chance. The world is going to control that child. The world is going to steer that wagon. You can't control them when they are the most controllable, the most impressionable, and you can't even be an influence on them at that point. This is why you don't spoil your kids. This is why the Bible gives all the specific ways to train your ch kids and to spank your kids and to discipline your kids, not to be mean or not to be abusive, but because you love them. You literally don't love them if you don't want to steer that wagon. So the Bible is saying here, the Bible is saying in 1 Timothy chapter 4, if we just apply that to children and apply that to it, the Bible is saying some things are good for your kids and some things are bad for your kids. You can't just say everything's good, but isn't that what we're being taught today? Don't judge, don't ever make a judgment call on anything. There is no evil, everything's great. No, some things are bad for your kids. Don't teach them lies. Don't teach them some things that are lies and some things that are true. I mean, are you crazy? Don't try to impress lies upon them. Don't, and I said Jesus is fake. How does Santa Claus, you know, make Jesus fake, Pastor? Isn't that kind of an extreme statement? Well, don't teach them some true things. Don't teach them about this guy. I had a parent one time that I knew, and I heard them say to their kids, Jesus and Santa are friends. I'm just like, is happening here. Don't teach them about this man, Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh. Don't teach them about that. Don't teach them about this man that came to earth, that was born of a virgin, that was God in the flesh. All the miracles that he did, all the amazing things that he did, the kindness that he had, the love that he had, the sacrifice that he had, and guess what? The eternal kingdom that he is reigning over and that he will reign over for eternity. Don't teach them about that, that truth, and then teach them all the same things about fake Santa. I mean, what are you trying to do? That he's this loving father figure, has all these magical powers, he can magically fly around the world and do all these amazing things that, I mean, he's, he's basically, he must be God to do this. He's eternal. This, I mean, it, Santa's been around for forever, right? Centuries. He must be eternal. He literally has the same attributes of God and Jesus, except it's all a lie. Amen. It's all not true. You don't think that's going to shake someone's faith, shake someone's confidence when parents lie to them for eight, nine 10 years of their life just to do what? Just to make them happy? Just to spoil them? To give them what they want? It's wicked. It's evil. Amen. It's the epitome of bad parenting. So that, I mean, he takes the place of Jesus. Except Jesus is true. That's the problem, though. Jesus wasn't, isn't some moral story. Jesus was really born of a virgin. Okay, we're celebrating Christmas. I don't know if he was born on December 25th. Probably not. But we're celebrating the birth of the Messiah that God sent his son to die for the sins of the world. That really happened. And if you trust in that, you will really be passed from death to eternal life. Really. It's true. So don't teach all these parallel lies to your small children, like the, the idea that people could do this, it, it just, I know, I know it's, it's shocking, 
But here's another one. It gets even worse. Here's a third one. So Santa, I mean, he, he tries, he's a lie that tries to replace Jesus or takes the same attributes of Jesus. The second one is this. It promotes, it promotes works-based salvation. The idea of Santa Claus is a subtle, a subtle attack on the gospel itself. You say, what? Look, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Here's the important list in the Bible. In Revelation chapter 20, look at verse number 15. But what does Santa teach? It says, be good, get a reward. Do good things, get a reward. He, he makes a list. He checks it twice. Just make sure he didn't make a mistake, I suppose. But you're not on the list. Coal or whatever, right? We'll get to that in just a second. But look at Revelation chapter 20, verse number 15. I mean, this is kind of a parallel to the Bible. The Bible says that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever is not written in the book of life is not getting a lump of coal. Whosoever is not saved, the Bible is saying here, is going to spend an eternity in hell, which will eventually be in the lake of fire. See, but here's the problem. You say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? This is Santa Claus. It's not real. Here's the problem, folks. Salvation is not a reward. You're like, what? It confuses the gift of salvation. It confuses the very idea of a gift. Right. I mean, how many times have you gone out soul winning and you do the gift example to somebody and you say, what if I gave you this pen or this invitation? And then I said, okay, but you have to go wash my car once a week. Is it a gift? How many times has anyone ever said, yes, it would still be a gift? Never. Because people know what a gift is. But this confuses the gift of salvation. Work hard. Be good. Get a gift. But wait a minute. I mean, kids all across America, listen to me, that believe in Santa Claus, you need to revolt right now. You don't work for a gift. All the kids that believe in Santa Claus should be against all these presents from Santa being gifts, and they should look at it, and they should open it and say, I earned this. Because that's what they did, right? They worked for it. There was a list that Santa checks. They earned that gift. Thing. And you'll see this with what Christian churches teach today. Nobody really gets coal in the Santa story. I wonder what the percentage of parents out there that teach this lie of Santa Claus to their kids that are like, you know what? You're a brat. Here's a chunk of coal. You probably couldn't find a chunk of coal in California to save your life. But it never happens. You know what this does? This promotes this idea that, yeah, as long as you try, everybody's going to heaven. And how many people believe that? That's what everybody believes. Everybody believes that if they're pretty good, they're going to make it to heaven. That's, in one version or another, that is what the vast majority of people believe. Do you know if you're going to go to heaven? And they will give you some version of, I think if I'm pretty good, I'm going to get to heaven. And you know, none of those people that think that will be in heaven. The Bible is super, it's either works or it's grace. It is not a mixture of the two. The Bible is very clear about that. I remember, I recognized, see, there, this is such a Protestant, even Catholic belief out there that nobody really goes to hell. I started to recognize this scam when I was just a teenager. I remember going to Lutheran funerals. I was decades away from being saved. I remember going to Lutheran funerals and listening to the pastor at the funeral talk about the person that was in the casket and just be like, we know they're in heaven because of their baptism or because of this or because of that or whatever. And I'm just like, I started to realize this is a scam. I'm like, you know, you go to a funeral, you're like, I knew that guy has never been in church. That guy hated church. That guy was a drunk. That guy, I mean, you believe in work salvation, and you're looking at somebody who was a terrible human being, who hated church, everything it stood for, stood for, and the pastor's up there preaching like he's in heaven. I'm like, this doesn't seem right to me. But it wasn't right. None of it's right, because nobody's getting to heaven by their good works, because if they have at least one bad one, you got one sin, you're done. So you say, why Christmas gifts? 
Why do we even give Christmas gifts? Turn to Matthew chapter 2. So look, it confuses the gift of salvation because we don't earn our salvation, folks. You got your salvation as a gift, like a real gift. You didn't do any work to get it. You say, well, where, do, where does the idea of Christmas gifts even come from? In, in my opinion, it's one of the dumbest things we do as Americans. We, we get each other these Christmas gifts. Mean, look, I do it too in my house. We give Christmas gifts, and we, take, we buy all these gifts, and we ship all these gifts across the country, and then people ship all these gifts to us, and then some gifts get stolen, and then we're all like, oh, it got stolen. And then some guy's running down the street with my Christmas gifts, and I'm in my car like, what are you doing with my Christmas gifts? I shouldn't. I wasn't supposed to tell this story. But it's just a really dumb thing that people do as Americans. But where did the idea of even gifts for Christmas come from? Now no one's going to get me anything. Look at Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 11. Here's the first. There's two, there's two leading theories here, all right, on the idea of where the tradition of gifts came from. It's, it's Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 11 that the wise men gave the child, Jesus, uh, gifts. Look at verse number 11. It says, and they were coming to the house. They saw the young child because they weren't there at the birth, okay, even though the nativity scenes say that. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense, and myrrh. So there's kind of the, one of the theories of like why we give Christmas gifts because the wise men, the, the kings brought gifts to Jesus. But really, I mean, the main reason that, you know, I believe that Christmas is surrounded with this idea of a gift is because Jesus is the gift. God gave his only begotten son. God gave us this gift. But look at Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. But the problem is this, folks, and this is what Santa Claus twists. We didn't earn that. As a matter of fact, the Bible is, is very clear to point out that we did the opposite of earn it. We did the opposite of earn Jesus coming here. We didn't deserve it. We didn't try. We didn't even get right. Nobody repented of their sins, and then God's like, oh, they repented of their sins. I'm sending Jesus. No. Nobody earned anything. It was just a gift. Look at Romans 5 and verse number 8. But God commendeth his love toward us. That means he showed his love toward us in that while we were yet what? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gave us this gift when we were sinning against him. We did nothing to earn it. We did the opposite. We should have got coal. We all, everybody deserves coal. Everybody deserves Hell is what the Bible would say, is what the Bible clearly teaches. Every single person that has ever lived is a sinner and deserves to go to hell. Amen. But God, while we didn't deserve it, gave us a gift. He gave us a way out. Because there's no way we're getting ourselves out of this. You can't be good enough. You can't be good enough to cover up something you've already done wrong. It's not possible. You can't, you can't go and, and, and murder someone or, or steal someone's car and then say, well, I'm good. You're going to jail. And God is the ultimate judge. He is the righteous judge. He never makes mistakes. So we didn't work for our salvation. If you're saved tonight, you didn't work for that. You trusted on what God gave you, and he gave it to you as a gift. And the word gift, everybody understands, even a child understands, just that word means it's free. Salvation is not a reward. And the gift from Santa is a reward. It confuses. It confuses. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I mean, was work done for either of those gifts? Did Jesus the child work for the gifts that the wise men gave him? No. Did, did we work for the gift of salvation? We didn't work for Jesus. No. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You still think it's harmless? Folks, at the top of the hill, that's the time to be focused, not sowing confusion with your children. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 33. The Bible says this. It says, for God is not the author of confusion. It's in all the churches of the saints. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. See, at the top of the hill, the major corrections can be made, but also the major errors. You can steer either all the way the right way, or you can steer all the way the wrong way at the top of that hill. 
So don't do anything as a parent to do these two things. Don't do anything as a parent to contradict God's word. This is why parents, you, the Bible speaks so harshly against hypocrisy, about a parent being, being a, a hypocrite, by, uh, about a parent telling his children one thing and then doing another. This is why God made children at the age of three, four, and five years old hypocrite detectors. This is why children are so in tuned to what their parents say, but they also, and more importantly, they watch what their parents do. God gave them that. Do not do anything as a parent. Look, no one's a perfect parent. But do not do anything purposely like Santa Claus and these, these lies to contradict the word of God. The second one is this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verse number 3. The second thing that you should never do as a parent is never do anything as a parent to confuse the simplicity which is in Christ. You see, Satan has no choice. God has made the gospel simple. You go to, a, go to a Pentecostal church and ask them what it takes to be saved, you can get some confusion there. You can get some confusing answers there. They're going to be like, well, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and don't sit, sin seven times in a day and do this, and you got to go, woo, 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 You got to just do all, you're going to get some serious confusion. You got to let this snake bite you, and you got to watch me die. I mean, whatever. I mean, it gets weird, but it's confusing. It's sowing confusion. Don't do anything as a parent to confuse the simplicity. See, the gospel is already simple. Satan has to confuse it. He has to make it complicated because it's already the simple best answer. Imagine being up against that. Somebody's got the best answer. Occam's razor. Occam's razor. The simplest solution is usually the best. That's the gospel right there. And he's got it. He has no choice. But to confuse it, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3. The Bible says, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. How did he do it? Through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The gospel is simple. It has to be corrupted and made complex and confusing in order for it not to be accepted. Don't do anything to confuse that simplicity. It's like God's packaged it up for you. He's packaged it up for these kids, and, he, and it's so simple that literally we will be out soul winning, and a 10-year-old will get saved. An 11-year-old will get saved. A 12-year-old will get saved. You'll have bunches of kids just understanding who Jesus is, what he did for them, what they have to do to get the gift of salvation, and they'll just get saved right on the spot because it's simple. Don't do anything to confuse that, especially in these crucial years. I mean, the idea of Santa is evil. It's to confuse children. And it has direct targets on salvation in their Christian life. Now, I, I want to take a couple minutes and just go over some accusations that, you know, Christian parents are going to go through if you just shun Santa from the moment your children are born, which you should, and, and you, for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, and Santa is just not a part of your household. The first one is this. Oh, you're no fun. You're no fun. Let me tell you something. Christmas is very joyful in my house. And Santa has nothing to do with it. It's, it that, that's a ridiculous even statement. I mean, is there, is there any other joy that is the joy that, that is in Christ? Is there any other better joy than knowing that while I deserve to go to hell, I have been given a gift of salvation and I don't have to go there anymore? And not only do I not know that I'm not going to hell, I don't ever have to worry about ever going to hell. God has made me that type of promise. Through who? Through Christ. Now it's, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend this December 25th remembering that God sent this Savior for me who deserved nothing of it, and, and that's not going to be joyful because of some fat fairy tale? Give me a break. Amen. It's ridiculous. So that, that's ridiculous. But here's, here's another one. And this is for the moms out there. Moms, homeschooling moms need to get meaner. 
They need to get meaner when people attack them. Because, you know what, moms? I would have loved to have been there every, sing every single time my wife got attacked for our beliefs or homeschooling or raising our children according to what this book we should do. I would have loved to have been there every single time, but I was there for very few of those times, actually. Because people won't say anything when I'm around. But moms need to get, homeschooling moms especially, Christian homeschooling moms need to start turning into wolverines in this country. I read, you know, what they'll say is, here's the second one they'll say, oh, you're, you're too serious. You're too serious. You're taking this stuff too seriously. <laughs> Yeah, you bet I'm serious about my children. You bet I'm serious about how I bring up my child according to what God says I should and shouldn't do. I read a blog post a few days ago about a mother's reaction, and I want to read this for you. And, and moms, you need to get like this, especially amongst other women that would come at you and subtly throw in digs about how you're doing things. Because guess what? You're right. And if you're doing things the correct way, you know what? Don't, don't feel bad if you hurt somebody's feelings. Who's being outright rude to you? But I, I, read, I want to read you this, this blog post. And it was this woman, she was asked, and, and, and like this, this has to do with homeschooling, but you should just apply this everywhere in your life, ladies. This lady was asked, and you'll be asked this very question, because my wife has been asked, I've been asked it just maybe a handful of times. My wife has been asked this many times. And what people will do is this lady says, we were asked why we homeschool. And she was explaining how when people ask her why they homeschool, it always turns into this rabid, angry response from the person defending why they do things the way they do things. So get the picture here. You have a homeschool mom who is asked a question. And this is her response. She said, when I started homeschooling, I would get asked why I chose that path. Honestly, or honesty would get them immediately defensive of their choice, and then instead of listening to me, they would start telling me why they would, could, never do it, blah, 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 she says. So look, here's another thing. If you ask a homeschool mom genuinely, on, like, why do you homeschool? They will be more than happy to tell you. But this woman is explaining that Every single time she was asked, she was almost immediately cut off, and the person just started angrily, I've, I've seen this so many times, started angrily defending why they don't do it that way, before she could even get her answer out. And then she continues, she said, to which, she said, you know, she's saying, this is the reaction that I get, and she says, to this reaction I generally respond, I don't care, I didn't ask you, you asked me. More moms should say that. Just when they start going off on why they do things, why they have a career, why they're leaving their children at daycare, why they don't think that homeschooling is it, why they think the public school is fine, why they think all these things are the right way to go, I don't care. I don't care. I didn't ask you. Because what homeschooling mom would ever want to know? She already knows why they made that decision. Because they're greedy. Because they're not saved. Because they don't believe the Bible. Even if they are saved, they're not going to sacrifice anything in their life for their own children. She's like, I don't care. I didn't ask you. You asked me. Memorize that one, ladies. Use it. Get used to people not liking your choices as parents. But guess what? They're all asleep at the wheel. They're all asleep at the wheel and they're asleep at the wheel the whole way down the hill. And you may think, you parents of young children, you may think that they're going to get down to the bottom of that hill, and when, the, when the, the, the destination they arrive at is jail, or death, or disease, or fornication, or a ruined life in what, whatever form that may be, you may think now that, oh, they'll realize then, they will never realize unless they get saved and have the Holy Spirit in them and start listening to this, they will never realize. They'll blame other people. They'll blame the system. They'll blame their own children at that point. 
but they will never realize. So just get that pipe dream out of your head. I used to have it too. They're all asleep at the wheel. Get used to people not liking it when you steer at the top because they're all laying down in the wagon. So it's not a small thing, all these lies that are told to our children. There's agendas behind everything. You look at anything that is being pushed on kids, you go into any cartoon, you go into any media that is targeted towards children, and there is a wicked, evil agenda. And you see why. Because everybody wants in the wagon, in your kid's wagon, at the top of that hill. If you don't steer, somebody else is going to. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.